Thank you, Tom. Um, so I'm going to talk about something different than uh, what I originally wanted to talk about, um, simply because there were so uh, there were extremely beautiful this talks this morning about um, using um, large amounts of data and translating them without prior hypothesis into dynamic. Um, Models and and I think that's that's great and that's one of the uh, one of the hallmarks of, of success of computational biology. Uh, we are seeing that this kind of um, model creation is is possible. <coughs> On the other hand, I think particularly uh, immunology uh, still offers many opportunities to start with pathways where. We roughly know the players, um, but we don't know exactly how they work together to produce what we see experimentally. So I'm, I'm talking more about um, detailed uh, mechanistic models of, of cellular signaling pathways. And uh, yeah, we happen to have um, one of the people who, who did, um, the, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful studies in, in this uh, area in, um, in among us, uh, Doug Laufenberger, who uh, together with uh, Peter Sorger and uh, John Albeck and uh, several others developed a fabulous model of uh, death receptor signaling. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about how we can use computers to generate these kinds of detailed models and how we can use thus computers um, basically as a, as a crutch to our intuition, to our reasoning. And I um, took this title actually from what uh, Tom suggested last night, was it last night? Uh, Computer Assisted Reasoning. Okay. So, to give you a bit, a, bit, um, a history of, of what I think how uh, biology and, and, and biomedical research uh, evolved uh, clearly, I in the early days, uh, biology and, and medicine were a more descriptive observational uh, science. And you see here uh, a very nice drawing, actually. It, it's not a photograph or so. It's a drawing from um, uh, early microscopy studies by uh, Van Leeuwenhoek. And um, over the years, obviously, um, biology and, and medicine has evolved into hypothesis-driven experimental science. So we are, we are challenging organisms, uh, sometimes entire mice, sometimes um, non-human primates or pigs, um, with uh, certain stimuli, and then we look for certain results. And obviously, while doing that, we have 
expectations of what's going to happen, because without those <coughs> expectations, we wouldn't be able to do any experiments. Recently, uh, biomedical research has become much more complicated. And as I said, we have, we have seen very nice uh, examples of this uh, this morning, where um, people look at far more complicated uh, signaling networks among cells, among um, <coughs> within cells, so bridging several scales. And there, uh, the challenge um, is not only to set up uh, the right experiments, but then really to, to um, analyze and understand uh, what has happened. And if you look at the uh, publications over the last decades, they actually reflect uh, this trend. Yeah, this is a, uh, a classic paper from uh, Immunology, the Journal of Immunology, 93. Uh, it has roughly 600 citations, which is a very a uh, good number in uh, immunology, and we actually have one of the authors uh, among us. Um, and the main result could be presented in a single figure, just showing cell proliferation, so cell counts um, under six different conditions. Just recently, um, a paper was published by uh, members of our lab, so the larger lab headed by uh, Ron Germain, um, that looked more like this. So there were uh, six uh, very complex figures in the main text, many supplementary figures, supplementary movies, and so on. And the whole study involved six years of work for a very talented uh, postdoctoral uh, researcher. So with this complexity, people have started to categorize research really into two c categories. One, uh, data-driven, where you start without prior hypothesis and you just look at the data and see, uh, if I analyze these data, what do I see, what do I get? And on the other hand, uh, the more classical hypothesis-driven um, approaches. And the uh, data-driven research usually is associated with computation analysis, computation tools, bioinformatics, obviously. Whereas the, uh, the hypothesis-driven um, experimentation and analysis frequently uh, is more associated with manual, low-throughput experimentation and analysis. And um, the question is, have we come to a point where um, we basically have to decide whether to follow our intuition or uh, use an automated approach and extract models through uh, the automated approach. So some people say um, this is a, a question of, of data first or hypothesis first, and there's a very interesting, um, there are two very interesting comments in Nature 2010, hypothesis first or data first. So what about our intuition? Um, what is special about our intuition? Where does it fail us? Where do we need computers? Um, those of you who know this picture, don't say anything. Um, those of you who don't, what do you see? Now this looks like one of those blots you might get at the psychotherapist, where you then have to see, to, to explain, oh, this is, I don't know, some fairy that is going to rescue me because I'm whatever, and then, uh, <laughs> and then the psychotherapist will will draw uh, the conclusions uh, accordingly. Uh, so, do people realize what it is? Yes, it's a dog. It's a Dalmatian in a high contrast black and white picture. And, and uh, I, I'm sure if, if, if you would have looked at it uh, long enough, and you would have found it. What about this one? Uh, this one is obviously far more difficult to interpret. Uh, even if I would tell you, which <coughs> I'm going to do in a couple of moments, what you're looking at, actually extracting the uh, essential features from here is far more uh, complicated. Why? I will explain why, and I will explain how computers can do this. Let me first explain what you were looking at. Uh, you were looking at um, <coughs> cells, uh, wild-type cells, and um, mutated cells. The mutated cells 
had a uh, deficiency in, in one adapter, an, an adapter that plays an important role in um, the contacts between T cells and, and APCs, uh, SAP. SAP itself um, means uh, SLAM associated <coughs> protein, and SLAM itself is an abbreviation, so the whole word would be uh, very long. Never mind. Um, those people who lack SAP have severe, um, severely impaired antibody production and several other immune um, effects. And the underlying mechanisms are really only uh, partially understood. But obviously, given the fact that there was this observation of impaired anti antibody production, the uh, hypothesis was or is that lack of SAP causes a defect during the processes of antibody production. Now you can take these um, in vivo microscopy data. And so now I'm going to explain what you're actually looking at. In red, you see um, wild type cells, so SEP proficient cells, T cells. In green, you see SEP deficient uh, T cells. And in blue, you see naive um, B cells that were mainly added to delineate uh, the, the borders, the boundaries of uh, this evolving um, germinal center. And the question now obviously is, um, can we extract from these observations what the differences are between SEP deficient and SEP proficient cells? And this might translate, for example, into the question um, what is the import and export behavior, or the, uh, the invasion or, or, or exit behavior of the two different types of T cells, the, the SEP proficient and the SEP deficient cells. And here computers can be immensely helpful. Um, using some tool we developed, uh, we were able to basically put some kind of a hull around the emerging uh, germinal center and then count uh, the T cells, the SEP proficient and the SEP deficient T cells. And indeed, you see that the SEP proficient T cells have a high probability to enter the, the emerging germinal center once they are on the boundary, whereas the SEP deficient cells have a higher tendency to leave uh, once they are on the boundary. And there the hypothesis obviously was that SAP, since it is an adapter that couples to uh, contact receptors uh, might cause a defect in the interactions between T cells and antigen presenting cells. So to quantify this, you would have to look deeper. You would have to look at pairs of, in this case, T cells and B cells and look at what is their, what are their contact characteristics? What is the contact duration, the contact surface and so on? And again, computers can be immensely helpful here because if we do this kind of visual analysis by eye, so I've, I've magnified this region here, and we're looking at a pair of cells, and we look by eye um, at the intensities of the cells and the region where basically uh, we see uh, the intensity of the blue cell surpassing the intensity of the green cell, and, and, and we would obviously be uh, tempted to say, okay, so this is uh, the, the contact region between the two cells. But computers can then be used to do normalized uh, intensity analysis and then correctly quantify uh, the interaction much better than we could do um, by eye. And if you do that, then you indeed discover that um, there is a very good correlation between um, the relative size of the cellular contact surfaces between the T cells, the SEP proficient and the SEP deficient T cells, and uh, the defects in terms of entering uh, these emerging uh, germinal centers. So going back to uh, where we started in the beginning, humans obviously are good at intuitively grasping certain qualitative patterns. So what we can do is we can, we can perform small numbers of tasks with high flexibility. Computers are extremely good at rigorously analyzing quantitative differences, so they can perform large numbers of simple tasks, but you have to tell them exactly what to do. So whereas we can probe different hypotheses somewhat vaguely, 
um, they can play through and that means in, in, in our field simulate different hypotheses. So the question is can we teach computers to understand our hypotheses and then test them, simulate them? And why do we want to do that? For example, in the, in the context of, of cellular signaling. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, this is the, the famous P53 stress cell, uh, cell stress response uh, network, uh, which if you boil it down to uh, the most fundamental components is very simple. You have an input coming from cell stress leading to the activation of P53. And then there is a negative regulatory component with some delay. And the negative regulatory component essentially is there to make sure that spurious activation of this cell stress response that usually proceeds then to cell death isn't triggered, uh, or spurious activation doesn't trigger cell death, that there is some uh, level of control here. Now, interestingly, if you just vary uh, the duration of the delay here, you get qualitatively different results, very strongly qualitative, uh, qualitatively different results. For, for the physicists among us, uh, that's obviously not so surprising because we know uh, if you have a feedback system and, and um, you vary uh, the, the delay between um, the negative feedback and the signal, you get either oscillations or a damp decay. But still, um, predicting this just by looking at this is uh, certainly not straightforward. Another example, more uh, complicated directly at first sight, would be a signaling network here, um, something related to uh, T cell activation, where we have um, just perhaps two handful of components, but uh, the variety of the different interactions and the way these interactions depend on phosphorylation states make it very difficult to um, predict how such a system would behave. And finally, if we now would add uh, space uh, into the equation, so the, the fact that all these signaling components are not mixed in one bucket, but instead um, they are distributed over a cell, so signaling processes um, being triggered here have to talk to processes that uh, were initiated here. And so the reaction diffusion and, and temporally and spatially delayed interactions um, play into this problem as well. And to uh, categorize perhaps what makes it difficult to intuit a pathways behavior, I think feedback regulation certainly is among the components, signaling network complexity quite obviously, and then spatially uh, distributed signaling processes. And I want to give you an example we studied, and um, sorry Tom, yes, it's again dictyostelium, but I <laughs> when I, when I told Tom that I was going to talk about something different than I originally planned, so not about IL-4 signaling, he said, are you going to talk about dictyostelium again? <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> the slime mold uh, <laughs> dictyostelium. So here you see dictyostelium uh, moving towards uh, a source of chemotractant, cyclic AMP. Uh, and the cyclic AMP source here was, was mixed with a red fluorescent dye um, to, to show you where the, the, the source of the chemotractant is. And as you see, uh, dictyostelium very nicely follows uh, the direction and even the moving direction of uh, the, the gradient, of the chemoattractant gradient. And um, the uh, underlying biochemistry in dictyostelium, and that's why I'm talking about dictyostelium, is uh, relatively uh, well known. The distribution of the signaling components, for example, in chemotactin dictyostelium. Yeah, the, um, uh, the receptors, surprisingly, are quite uniformly distributed. Um, the G protein subunits also mostly uniform. Um, here, this um, reporter here, a pH domain uh, that binds to PIP3, is not is not at all uh, uniformly distributed. So PIP3 reported here by a fluorescent pH domain accumulates at the side of the cell that faces the high concentration of um, the chemoattractant. 
Pietri kinase, the kinase that produces this, is also slightly accumulated. But uh, P10, the phosphatase that would turn PIP3 back into its, one could say, precursor PIP2, is strongly excluded here from uh, the front of the cell. The fundamental signaling um, has been known for, for quite a while. There's a, a very nice uh, review that, uh, although already 10 years old, is still um, very nice to read. So um, the ligation of the seven transmembrane G protein coupled receptors activates the G proteins. The G proteins then activate ROS, then ROS activates PI3 kinase, and PI3 kinase translates PIP2 into PIP3. And then on the other hand, there is uh, a mechanism that uh, basically competes with this transformation. Uh, P10 transforms PIP3 back um, into PIP2. And, and PIP3 uh, plays an important role because it recruits components that play a role for the activation of the uh, cytoskeleton. So the front of the cell where it crawls needs uh, PIP3 or is actually defined uh, at least in dictyostelium by the presence of PIP3. Now if you expose these cells um, to a homogeneous concentration of cyclic MT, not a gradient, just you give them a homogeneous uh, concentration, this looks like a gradient but it's, uh, it's, a, it's an artifact that they actually see a homogeneous concentration. What you will see is in the PIP3 response all around the cell, so PIP3 that gets accumulated um, to uh, the whole periphery of the cell, it will peak uh, very fast, so there's a fast response, but then again um, there is a fast adaptation. So there must be a negative uh, feedback regulation basically bringing this uh, response down um, to essentially a pre-stimulus level. And the, 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 the simple canonical pathway, uh, at least in this diagram, uh, doesn't contain these negative regula regulatory components, but we know essentially what they are. Uh, for example, receptor-associated kinases, ROS GUPs that interfere with uh, ROS signaling, and components that deactivate um, PR3 kinase. So, however, with these additional negative regulatory components, we have this situation where we have um, basically a, a crosstalk between excitatory and inhibitory components, the pathway's behavior becomes more complex. And the question is, can we now use computational modeling to explore uh, how it will behave? Now, the, com common, the most common modeling approaches you will find when you read um, modeling papers are, uh, for example, listings of, of differential equations describing how things change over time. Sometimes uh, people will give you a corresponding SBML file, which in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the classical core SBML is, is essentially a listing of, of these equations. And um, sometimes um, you will also see um, a visualization in form of a network. And even though these are all um, valid renderings of, of what's going on. They share uh, certain disadvantages. They're relatively difficult to construct, read, or modify. And, and certainly, they are not really immediately accessible to non-theorists. And that's why we developed an approach that is slightly different. We said, OK, let's start with something that is closer uh, to the way the signaling pathways and molecular interactions are usually depicted in non um, theoretical uh, publication. So we depict our interacting molecules and uh, their binding sites with these iconographic symbols. So this, for example, is uh, a receptor that binds uh, to G proteins. When it is activated, this is the ligand. These are the binding sites uh, the components use. And essentially, we developed a drawing tool that allows you to draw these things. And when you define how they interact, you give the software enough information to translate it into these sets of differential equations. For example, this interaction would be um, translated once you run a simulation into an equation that might look like this, where uh, we track uh, the concentration of the free receptor over time. Uh, 
um, as a function of, for example, the concentration of the ligand, the concentration of the free receptor, and the on rate, so the association rate between the two. Note uh, the minus sign here. So whenever the ligand binds the receptor, obviously we are taking away free receptor. That's why we have a minus sign here. On the other hand, um, when the ligand receptor complex decays with uh, the dissociation rate, we are creating free receptor. Again, that's why we have a plus sign here. Other um, events than downstream, for example, receptor activation, can be called in a similar way. We, we just say that, okay, the ligated receptor is not just the ligated receptor, but it's a ligated activated receptor. And the software will create the corresponding equations. And similarly for G protein recruitment and um, G protein activation and then dissociation of the G proteins into G alpha and G beta gamma subunits. And we know that, for example, in, in many cases, in, in many instances of, of um, uh, chemotractant responses, free G beta gamma is really the, the signal that the cell sees. Now, if you take um, such a model where you have the uh, inhibitory components, uh, then obviously uh, you have to be able to, to reproduce what has been found experimentally. And one thing you have to be able to reproduce is, for example, the adaptation response uh, when you give uh, the homogeneous stimulation. Another thing um, you have to be able to reproduce, obviously, is the polarization of the cells, that if you give a uh, gradient of the chemoattractant, they will polarize, um, in this case, PIP3, um, here to the front of the cells so of the side that receives the strongest chemotactic stimulation. But when we started this modeling um, project, which actually was already quite a number of years ago, uh, we didn't know how, what to expect, how this accumulation at the front would look like over time with the negative regulatory components. And it turned out that the cells, in order to achieve both um, the adaptation and the polarization, need to do both at the same time. So when you give uh, a gradient and you look at the accumulation of PIP3 at the front and the loss or the adaptation of, of PIP3 in the back, you see that, yes, actually the cells first display a response you would see in the uniform stimulation and then only in the second phase you see this polarization of PIP3 uh, to the front of the cell. And this was experimentally uh, very nicely confirmed. But just having uh, a model that reproduces experimental data um, is in itself um, not so interesting because um, there might be a lot of other models that do the same thing. If you're just looking at whether you're capable of reproducing experimental data, the interesting um, thing you can do with models is that you can now dissect these responses in detail. So for example, looking at this biphasic response in the chemotractant gradient, you can identify an excitation phase, a rapid suppression phase here, which corresponds to adaptation, then a slower polarization phase, and then um, a very slow inhibition phase that essentially keeps the cells from locking in into one direction. So when you then change the direction, they are flexible enough to um, look somewhere else and, and respond to the changing direction. And if you look um, a bit closer at this slow inhibition at the molecular level, then you will see that it builds up at the, that's at the side of the, the high concentration stimulation. So we have negative um, regulatory components that are recruited to the side of the high concentration of the chemoattractant. And the question is, or the question was at that time, um, is there perhaps some kind of a memory effect due to the accumulation of these negative regulatory components uh, at the front of the cell? And could this memory effect perhaps be so strong that uh, if you stimulate the cells first with the gradient, you take away the gradient, and then within a certain time window, you reapply the gradient, the cell perhaps polarizes against the applied gradient. So you catch the cell on the wrong foot. And this was indeed uh, what was observed experimentally. So here, um, even though in the end, 
uh, it turned out that our model was wrong. As I said, models can reproduce experimental data, many of them, and at some point you realize the model was wrong, but the model was the trigger to perform this kind of experiment and to see do we have these negative regulatory components, and they were there indeed. So the model served basically um, as an incentive to do certain experiments, and that's, I think, everything you can expect from a model, because in the end, um, all the models uh, we build, even uh, the wonderful uh, death receptor model, uh, at some point will be thrown in the trash because they serve their purpose. But um, one part of the model, namely the, the, the input level, we were quite confident uh, that it was correct because we had uh, a lot of data uh, from threat experiments between uh, G-alpha and G-beta gamma uh, to uh, look at it. And so we used the model to take a closer look at G-protein activation. There were two um, competing hypotheses, and there are still in different G-protein coupled receptor systems competing hypotheses. In the chemotactic uh, system, one of the hypotheses was that um, you perhaps had a pre-association of the G-proteins with the receptor, and then the ligand binding induces the release of the G-proteins so you have a pre-coupling and then a one-shot release of the G-proteins. Uh, the competing model was that um, only the activated receptor would recruit the G-proteins um, and then the G-proteins would, be, would become activated and could be recruited again and again or other G-proteins could be recru recruited again and again to lead to a high throughput of G-protein activation. And we could, um, with our tool, translate these competing hypotheses into uh, computational models and then perform computational experiments where we triggered or challenged these systems uh, with ligand and looked at the responses um, in terms of G-protein activation. And the experiments then made a clear choice. So when we used a FRET pair, between G-alpha and G-beta-gamma and looked at the time course, um, we could show that even if you vary these parameters in this model over a broad range, uh, whenever you get uh, basically some kind of a preloading, the curves rather look like this. And if you have a mixture of preloading and induced activation, they look a bit like this. But the experimental data clearly favored uh, the ligand-induced recruitment of the G-proteins. And um, so the next slide is really just uh, to give you an idea of uh, where we are going now in terms of um, the uh, whole cell simulations of the signaling pathways. Um, it shows three different components, the responses of three different components and how slowly or fast they adapt when you flip the direction of a gradient by 90 degrees. So this is now a cell that contains these signaling pathways I showed you. And this cell is now challenged first with a gradient that goes in this direction and then a gradient that goes in the other direction. And with the increased resolution of the microscopy data we have now, uh, we can now test these very detailed models of intracellular signaling um, and intracellular gradients of activation and recruitment of certain components in detail. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and now I should be claiming that this runs on the laptop while I'm showing it. No, no. <laughs> no in terms of the, the, the time scale of the response itself. Um, but yes, that no, I mean, this, the, the movie has been translated basically. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 But, but no, we are paying obviously a bit more in terms of computer time. Oh, sure. The next thing I want to do is to show you a bit how you can use uh, computational models to explore uh, the coupling between cellular biochemistry and morphology. And I want to focus on um, one of the most simple, at least at the surface, in, in the true sense of the word, at the surface, the most simple um, interaction uh, we've been studying so far, namely uh, the e cadherin mediated uh, formation of cell-cell contacts. So if you have two cells that express e-cadherin, 
these cells will make contacts that um, are basically established in two steps. You have one step where you have the formation of trans bonds between the two adjacent cells. And then these trans bonds are um, stabilized through cis bonds, cis meaning within one membrane. So a trans dimer would, for example, recruit other components here that would bind in cis, so through this other binding site and stabilize uh, the contact over time because you could have then additional trans bonds between the two cells. And one of the characteristic features of this system is that um, E. cadherin accumulates at the edges of these cell-cell contacts. Yeah, you can quantify this if you have a fluorescent um, reporter or dra directly fluorescent E. cadherin. You see this accumulation. You have to think of this obviously in 3D. Yeah. And um, one of the surprising features of this system is that when you truncate the cytoplasmic tail of, of E. cadherin, so you're just looking basically at the surface interactions, the, the interactions between the extracellular domains, um, then you will still see um, a recruitment of E. cadherin to the interface, but you won't see this characteristic accumulation um, at, the, at the periphery, at the edges of this contact. And a lot of people thought, well, that's, that's weird because if you, if you think about the situation, you have these cells in contact um, and they stick together long enough, uh, you, you see the receptors diffuse in from the sides and just diffusional trapping should be enough to create uh, these high concentration rings here at the periphery. So that was something you could test computationally because the parameters here are all known. So the, the density of the receptors is known, the diffusion uh, coefficients are known, uh, the association rates are known, the dissociation rates are known, and so on. Now, if you translate this into, granted, a simple uh, signaling network uh, using these two types of interactions, trends and cis, you end up with something that looks um, quite manageable. Yeah? This is a system where, for example, uh, the interaction between, uh, the trans interaction between two monomers forms this trans dimer, cis interactions might form cis dimers, trimers, and so on, different kinds of tetramers, obviously open and closed. The thing is, if you now include uh, the spatial component, so now you don't just look at the biochemistry, but you look at the fact that these receptors are actually embedded in the surface of two cells, and you have left and right, uh, then the situation becomes much more complicated. Now you have um, all kinds of interactions between different versions, es essentially, of biochemically identical components, but now they differ uh, as to whether they are left or right. And um, I challenge you, and, and I mean it, um, if you find for this uh, very simple system, yeah, just trans and cis interaction between two cells, if you find uh, the correct set of equations describing um, how uh, the concentration of the monomers, the different dimers, uh, uh, cis and, and, and trans uh, trimers and so on. If you find the correct equations for this extremely simple system, I will give you a very nice bottle of wine. <laughs> um, the, the problem is uh, you, you always get the symmetry factors wrong. Um, so that's the challenge. But the nice thing is that um, if you teach a computer what the fundamental interactions are, so for example, this trans interaction and then um, subsequent uh, cis interactions, the computer, if you have the right program, and I hope we have, uh, the computer will get it right. Um, yeah? uh, while we were developing actually this simulation program, we used this as a test system. And I can tell you many, many times we sat there and said, no. Now it's wrong. Uh, now we, we have a bug somewhere. We have to fix it. But the computer was right in the end. It was right and right and right, and we were wrong. OK, so uh, a simple system, and you can tell the computer directly what to do. You can create computational models of the cellular morphology. And then uh, if you combine these, a biochemical model plus a model of the cellular morphology, you have a computational model of the whole system. 
and you can use it. I'm sorry, you, you cannot. Uh, wait, can you see it? Too? So you, you, you put these two cells together um, on your computer, essentially, and uh, you let uh, the, uh, the Katerians diffuse in and, and watch what they do, um, driven by the reaction of fusion in the system. And what you get is this very nice high concentration ring at the periphery of the contact. Perfect. That's what we wanted. Yeah, we um, wanted this kind of distribution because that's what the experimental data told us we will see. Um, so the accumulation at the periphery, just the diffusional trapping. However, um, if you now simulate this system in a dynamic situation, so you let the system uh, essentially evolve, you, you bring cells into contact uh, first at a very small spot, and then you watch how the cell-cell contact um, grows uh, over time, basically driven uh, by the biochemistry in this system, then what you will see um, oops, is that yes, you have receptor accumulation at the interface, but it looks different. So remember this was the static case, this is the dynamic case, and in the dynamic case, uh, the accumulation of the receptors is there, so you, you see a higher concentration at the interface, but essentially um, the, uh, the, the concentration profile of the component follows uh, the morphological features of the interface. <coughs> so this accumulation at the edge um, is gone, it's no longer there. And uh, the hypothesis was that maybe it's because the coherence diffuse to rapidly uh, to be trapped at uh, the um, evolving interface. Yeah? And, and that would make sense if you, if you think about the function of these coherence, they are there uh, to make cells glue together. So once uh, two cells form a small contact, the coherence should come in very quickly to stabilize this small contact. Yeah? And then while the contact is growing, they just follow the contact. And that's why in uh, a dynamic simulation, uh, performed with um, very uh, realistic parameters in terms of growth of the contact. You don't see the accumulation at the edges, um, but um, just accumulation following uh, the morphology. And to test <coughs> this hypothesis, whether it's really this, this uh, competition <coughs> between the speed of diffusion and the speed of, of with which the, uh, the interface grows, you can perform <coughs> simulations, for example, with 15 times lower diffusion coefficient. That's obviously difficult to do experimentally, but you can do it on the computer. And then you see that if you do, if you have this 15 times lower diffusion coefficient, you see the accumulation at uh, the periphery of the interface. And vice versa, if you um, make, um, if you shift the balance uh, in favor of, of the growth of the interface by making the interface uh, grow five times faster, again, you get um, the accumulation at the edge. So at least internally, uh, it's consistent. And this explains why um, when you have these e coherents and you truncate uh, their cytoplasmic domain, you get accumulation at the interface, but not um, the uh, uh, the characteristic ring, high concentration ring at the periphery. To get this, uh, you actually need active transport mechanisms that pull the coherence out of the central uh, contact zone uh, to the periphery. Let me now um, just give you a little bit outlook of, of what we are uh, working on, namely to make these computational models a bit more realistic, also in the context of uh, immunological modeling, in particular modeling of uh, T-cell APC interactions. So here you see uh, basically a, a movie that sweeps through uh, the layers of uh, a microscopy Z-stack, showing a T-cell here in red, the small red T-cell in contact uh, with a B-cell. And what we can do now is we can take um, these microscopy data and reproduce um, the shape of these cells, basically reproducing the most 
uh, probable shape that corresponds to this z stacks. And now we can start to simulate um, the signaling processes at this interface, taking into account the specific morphology of the contact. We can use similar tools to take, for example, images of entire lymph nodes and translate them into computational renderings of the fiber networks, the extracellular fiber networks uh, within uh, these uh, lymph node structures. And since we are capable of simulating uh, intracellular uh, signaling pathways in the context of, of cells that, shape, uh, that change their shape, uh, the next step will be to combine these models of extracellular structures with models of cells that carry with them uh, entire signaling pathways to see what kind of um, interplay do we get between uh, the extracellular structure, local accumulations of cells and so on, and the intracellular signaling pathways. And I want to point out that what you're looking at here are cells that really carry with them already um, a not completely trivial signaling pathway. So I don't know whether you can see it, but whenever the cells make a contact, you see in the contact region, you see some purple light up. And this is um, a model of, of calcium flux at uh, cell, cell contact regions. And it's, it's not a huge uh, model uh, that's extremely realistic, but it's already, already a serious model. So this is not just an animation, but these cells carry with them an entire signaling pathway and they, they react to stimuli uh, they receive from uh, their receptors from the external world. And this is where I want to um, stop and I want to acknowledge uh, the work of, of the people uh, who work with me, Bastian Angermann, Fengkai Zhang and Alex and Thorsten, Frederik Klauschen who is now at the Charité in Berlin and we have a very strong collaboration with a group of Rajat Varma, <coughs> uh, Tianjin and Shuwa Shu, uh, the, the uh, chemotaxis projects. And I want to acknowledge uh, the support, the ongoing support by uh, Ron Germain, who's the director of our lab, and obviously financial support uh, through the uh, NIID. Thank you very much. So this model uh, was in a way cheating, as are all models, uh, in the sense that we basically gave uh, the morphology of the cells a tendency to crawl in one direction. So this was independent of, of a chemotactic signal. What we were interested in was basically the persistence and the uh, evolution of this, this calcium flux at the yeah. contact interfaces. And at this point, it's a, it's a feasibility study. Um, to see how far can we go um, combining intracellular signaling with uh, morphology kinetics of, of single cells, which is obviously <coughs> quite demanding and, and some of the challenges involve uh, how can you parallelize this because obviously you have a coupling between the different components yeah. and so on. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit why is it that multiple modes produce that uh, they tend 
second question is, when you show the, uh, when you offer the one, mm -hmm. what I want to get, and I'm getting that one, <laughs> I don't like one, by the way, is that uh, you were showing a system of OTEs mm -hmm. versus a computational and uh, age-based model, I think, of kurtosis, and you said it's in the representation. Uh, how, and I don't have clear how can you compare an OD model which cannot characterize the state versus a model that will characterize the state. Okay, so um, the first question, um, why there can be a range of different models uh, and related how there can be a range of different behaviors within a model. So uh, the second perhaps first, I mean obviously uh, cells, if you, if you analyze cells uh, using flow cytometry or um, any single cell technique, you will see a, a wide a variability obviously in the expression levels of, of, of proteins and so on. Um, and this variability obviously will translate into a variability in terms of the response of these signaling networks. So even with a given signaling network, uh, if you change um, uh, the concentrations, the initial concentrations of uh, the components, you can have you know, uh, wildly varying uh, results. And this is, by the way, something um, that is, is, I think, one of the um, one of the most important developments of, of the recent past that people are getting, uh, becoming aware of this variability in terms of uh, protein um, expression and the results in terms of variability of the responses. Yeah, In the past, 10 years ago or so, um, one of the criteria, uh, one of the quality criteria of a computational model was whether it was uh, in its behavior robust towards changes um, in these concentrations. So whether if you varied the concentrations, you would still qualitatively get the same result. And I think now we've learned and, and um, yeah, the, the whole uh, siRNA business uh, taught us that if you, um, if you suppress something by 50%, uh, you get a phenotype, which means obviously uh, changing something by 50% makes a huge difference. So asking models to be robust uh, towards uh, changes of 500% of something may just be completely wrong. Yeah, so uh, that's one thing. But um, regarding your, your other question, uh, with the different models uh, that can explain a certain uh, experimental um, uh, data set, I mean, yeah, for example, for the simple G-protein activation model, you only have uh, you only have essentially the receptor that gets activated and then G-alpha and G-beta-gamma. No other. So there it was very simple. The question was, did you have preloading <coughs> of the receptor or not? And there you have only one model and you just change one aspect of it. But if you have a more complicated model, then you have more degrees of freedom. And ultimately, um, in most cases, different models, really entirely structurally different models, um, can explain um, uh, certain um, sets of experimental data and that's something uh, we are addressing currently um, in a project where we look at cytokine signaling in T cells and we don't know exactly what the model is but uh, thanks to the fact that we are using computers to construct the model, model construction has become very cheap. Yeah, in the past it involved sitting down writing the equations but now we can do it automatically so now we can scan basically the structural space of all kinds of models that make sense somehow. And then we scan the space of the types of behavior they can have, and then we can say, okay, um, which of those models basically is, is capable of reproducing all the experimental data we have with parameters that physiologically make sense. Oh, that was one. Uh, no, the um, when I showed you when I showed you these these um, these icons basically of molecules and their interactions. This is the the visual language we are using to define molecular interactions. But in the simulation, these are translated uh, into ODE or in spatially resolved 
uh, case PVEs. And we can also perform stochastic simulations if the systems are not too big. Um, but um, no, these icons are really just for the construction and the visualization of the model. We are not simulating, <coughs> uh, at this point, uh, single molecules moving on the cell surfaces, which uh, would, be, um, would be interesting in many cases. Yeah, but we don't at the moment. The next speaker is Peter Lindsley, who spent many years developing drugs uh, against the immune system or for the immune system, depending on exactly what the immune system was doing at the time, uh, at Merck, Bristol Myers Squibb, and several startup companies as well. And he has now uh, come over to the light side and uh, is now a research scientist at the Benaroya Research Institute, and he's going to be telling us about new approaches to autoimmunity. There it goes, there we go. Okay, okay good, thank you. All right, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming, thanks for the introduction, Tom. And I'd also like to thank Tom for the invitation to speak and the uh, invitation to participate in the summer school uh, this week. It's been a lot of fun, I've enjoyed it. Um, so um, I'm going to do a little bit different than uh, some of the other speakers today. The story I'm going to tell you is not a complete story. I'll acknowledge that up front, but it's, I'm going to tell you uh, where we're going. Um, and one of the reasons I, I left industry, uh, aside from not enjoying what I was doing, was that uh, I wanted to uh, try to apply some of the, these, the systems biology techniques uh, to autoimmunity. And um, I'll show you one of the, where we're going. So uh, the title of my talk is applying sing uh, examining single cell transcriptomics is a new systems biology approach. Um, I don't need to tell this audience that uh, about single cell analysis. Uh, this is a cartoon of single uh, t of cell uh, immune cell subtypes in um, autoimmunity. Uh, immunologists are well aware of the, the, the power of single cell analysis. We've been doing it for 30 years or so. Um, um, and it's, it's sort of the workhorse of immunology. Uh, as an example of the sort of things that we can do with single cell analysis, um, last 10 years or so, we can actually uh, identify the actual pathogenic cells that cause various autoimmune diseases and, and al allergic diseases. Uh, and the way we do this in the human is by using what are called uh, MHC class II tetramers, which are recombinant forms of the MHC class II molecule loaded with various antigens, antigenic peptides, uh, that can then stain uh, uh, um, uh, pathogenic, what we think are pathogenic T cells in various diseases. And what we're looking at here in this slide is a uh, composite from uh, Gary D. Baum and Bill Kwok in Benaroya, looking at uh, antigen specific uh, cell types in swine flu, West Nile virus, yellow fever virus, dengue virus, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, cancer, and allergy. Uh, various subsets of the Uh, as 
this very powerful technique. We can actually uh, pull out single cells now that react with the antigens that we're interested in. Um, but this presents a, uh, is presented sort of a conundrum in that uh, we can identify these antigenic uh, subsets, but we can also find them in normal people. So the question is, why aren't normal people, why isn't everyone all, uh, allergic or autoimmune? What's the difference in these cells in allergic uh, patients and uh, normal patients? So the hypothesis is that CD4 cells from affected patients are somehow different from those uh, with the same antigenic specificity that are found in normal individuals. And over the years, people have uh, used various uh, antibody staining techniques, flow cytometry, to look at some of these difference, differences. And there's uh, numerous hypotheses around in various cases that I showed you previously. This is a little bit, uh, I don't want to diminish the progress, uh, but it's a little like looking for your keys under the lamppost because antibodies that are available for flow cytometry, there's not that many of them uh, relative to the entire genome. We've got a pretty good core and we have maybe a couple of hundred different antibodies we can stain with and that doesn't, uh, you can't use them all in all combinations. So you're limit, looking at a relatively limited fraction of the genome to find differences in, in these individuals. So um, what we've been looking at over the last six months or so is uh, whether we can use single cell transcriptomics to identify in a more non-biased, uh, uh, data-driven approach to identify differences in uh, CD4 cells, antigenic, uh, antigen-specific CD4 cells in disease in affected patients or in disease to normal patients. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about two um, two areas is one is some of the technical challenges in doing single cell transcriptomics and what we're doing to face those. And then at the, the second part of the talk, I'm going to give you uh, uh, an actual uh, test case uh, using uh, allergic T cells. So technical challenges without getting too much into it. Um, this is the, uh, the way we're doing our transcriptomics. It's a new instrument that was uh, released by Fluid on around Christmas time last year. Um, we've had it for a little bit longer than that. But basically, the self-contained unit about this big for uh, capturing single cells in a little thing that looks like this. And when the cells are washed and stained, they're isolated using uh, fluid dynamics, very small nanometer channels. And then in situ, they're not they're lysed. Uh, reverse uh, RNA is prepared in the little chamber. They're reverse transcribed and amplified. So it's a pretty cool little uh, system. Um, it's called the C1. And the way it works, uh, it's, e easy, it's easy to distinguish, or why to use this rather than a conventional 96 well uh, flow cytometry set situation. Well, it's easy to distinguish between wells with no cell, single cell, two cells, clumps, so forth. It's, they don't, clumps don't work, but uh, it's relatively easy to look at these under a microscope. It's, it's a, close to a 96 well where things are kind of swimming around, it's hard to localize. It's nanoscale, it means it's cheaper, less reagents. Uh, the fluidics are general, uh, general to cells and uh, it uses off the shelf reagents, which is nice, they're not, they're not uh, proprietary, anybody can buy them. And uh, I'm gonna be talking about the smarter cDNA uh, kit from Clone Tech and we use Nextera libraries for Illumina. And also there's a PCR version. I'm not gonna be talking about that today. Um, so technical challenges, we basically got three. Uh, distinguishing biological variability from noise, making good cDNA, and then analyzing the data. And they're all related and hope to give you a flavor for how this is. Uh, this is a really stupid cartoon uh, showing it what I think is one of a key experiment uh, the idea came up this week in one of the classes about looking at single cells, single cell transcriptomics, and uh, the, one of the students said, well, how do you distinguish biological variability from PCR noise? And that really is one of the, the key questions here. And, and this is really the experiment, the only experiment I know of to, to actually do that. 
so essentially, when you do the, 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 the fluid I've seen one, you're isolating cells in a little nano well or a little well. You make about a, with T cells, you're making about a microgram of RNA per cell, per well. You make a cDNA library and you do an RNA seq. So that's the experimental system. But what you want to do is show that there's differences in these three cells, biological variability, not due to this part of technical variability. So uh, as a control, a lot of people use. the same. So when we do that, uh, we get this kind of result. Uh, on the x-axis here, we're showing the mean of 89 different individual cell libraries, K562 cells. And we're looking at it as a mean of the uh, reads per million for all the different tens of thousands of transcripts that we identify. You'll notice on all my plots, I have RPMs plus one, and that's because we get a lot of zeros. And they go away when you try to do logarithms. So uh, we've added one to everything. <coughs> the y-axis is uh, the average of about 24 uh, technical references. So you can see that they correlate pretty well, but they're not identical. They're not, they're not uh, there's a lot of variability. So technical replicates uh, differ to some extent from, to, uh, from the biological uh, replicates. And when you do PCA on these, this is actually good news. You can actually separate the two groups very clearly. So that shows that we can tell the biological variability from the technical variability. But there's still a lot of technical variability there. And one example of that is shown uh, in this experiment. Uh, uh, I think it's from the same, I actually don't know if it's the same experiment or not. But what we, we've done is to ask for cells that show bimodal distribution. We're very excited about being able to detect uh, genes that um, are bimodal. They're off in some cells and on in others. And there's actually, in the cancer field, people do that to, to classify uh, uh, genes as good biomarkers, genes that show bio, good bimodal distribution. And there's an R package for actually identifying uh, genes in, in, uh, in tumors. We just apply the same algorithm to to individual cells, treating each, treating each one like you would a tumor. And sure enough, it finds genes that look like they have bimodal distribution. There's a lot of zeros in these T cells here. Uh, these are very reproducible. You do the experiment again, the same genes show bimodal distribution. The ones that don't show bimodal distribution tend to show not bimodal distribution again. So something reproducible is happening here. So we're very excited about this until we did the uh, technical replicates. And this is the same panel I showed you previously. There are the technical replicates, and they look very much the same. So there's something happening here that's causing bimodal distribution, but it's not biology, it's technical variation. So you gotta be very careful with doing this stuff. And I think what this says is there's no way to look at the profile, and just look at this profile and say whether well, there's a biological So that's very related. Uh, why this happens, we think, is to the problem of making good cDNA from interesting cells. Without getting too technical, um, the uh, cDNA protocol that we use here is from Clone Tech, sort of smarter technology. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, but they claim it's sensitive enough to generate uh, cDNA from as little as 10 micrograms of input RNA. That sounds pretty good. Uh, but then they say that the recommended input is 100 micrograms to 10 nanograms, 1,000 times more, 10 to 1,000 times more, uh, to get, quote, reproducible amplification of low abundance in RNA transcripts. Well, what that still doesn't sound like a lot, but a single lymphocyte has only a microgram of RNA, if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so we've got a big gap here. So we're pushing this technology into areas where it hasn't 
been designed to go. Um, maybe this is a bad analogy, but I kind of think of it as like subatomic physics where Newtonian laws kind of break down. We have no idea what's going to happen to the uh, uh, cDNA synthesis when we push it this low. Um, so we, after much several trials to make good cDNA from T cells, we said we decided that we needed to activate them to get more RNA per cell because we were having problems getting cDNA. So we turned to an old school uh, uh, technique that nobody uses anymore. It's plate-bound antibodies. And we tried weak activation and strong activation with anti-CD3 and uh, CD20, anti-CD28 in uh, solution. Once again, um, the profiles that we got out of, we got 56 libraries, uh, 20, uh, uh, sorry, 56 from the strong activation, 28 from the weak activation. And once again, the, 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 the overall profiles separate pretty nicely by uh, ECA. So there are differences. And uh, this is actually kind of cool when you look at actual T cell markers, just as you, you, you would stain T cells with. T cell markers, CD4, 5, 6, CD2, CD8, CD7, 28, CD3, so on. Um, I should tell you these are CD4 cells, so the fact that CD8 is <coughs> negative here is good. It should be. Um, but on the left, when you see weak activation, uh, you can see some of these, they look kind of ratty. I mean, they're, they're not really clean profiles. And you can see some, some cells. What we're looking at here is history. So amplifying, or you can amplify the other amount of RNA there and get better libraries if you use activated cells. So all this has a bearing on how you analyze the data, what the data look like, and how you analyze them. This is um, a comparison of uh, the distribution of, of reads um, shown as density plots that you get from a typical macro scale, population scale RNA-seq experiment. We're looking at 40 RNA-seq populations, half from CD4 cells, half from CD8 cells. And we're looking at the distribution of transcripts found in different uh, reads per million. And uh, the, the data have been filtered at at least one read uh, in uh, two or more, or more than two libraries. And so, scale analysis of this, this is the profile you get. It looks kind of like microarray did it do. Uh, tiny bit of zero, so forth and so on. So that, that, that's what normal RNA seq data look like. When you do C1 data for roughly similar numbers of cells, filter the same way, you get what many fewer genes detected, uh, 5,800 as opposed to about 17,000 here. And most of the reads that you get back to zero. scale on it, now you begin to see a more reasonable distribution. And you can see some differences between, in this case, allergic and healthy CD4 cells. But the point is that C1 libraries uh, uh, have a lot of genes that give zero reads some of the time. It's called zero inflation. And this is a problem. Um, the determinants of zero inflation are, uh, we don't know exactly, we, our hypothesis, well, show you the core of this and I'll tell you what we think the cause is. The uh, deeper sequencing helps a little bit. Uh, you get greater zero inflation with primary CD4 T cells than with C K562 cells. If you got an interesting experiment to do with K562s, we could do it, but T cells are a little harder. Um, the uh, zero inflation is greater for short transcripts that have higher or low GC content 
and or less abundant. The likely root cause, we think, is non-reproducible amplification because of low mRNA input. So what happens is sometimes you get amplification, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you get a zero, and sometimes you get a read. So this causes problems for analyzing the data. The single cell data contain many zeros. They're not normally distributed. So most, many of the methods uh, for, for RNA-seq are based on the assumption of oral distributions. They don't apply here. Uh, we think non-parametric methods work better, but uh, we don't think we found the answer to this. There's, it's a problem, and if there's anybody out there who would like to collaborate on this, I'd love to talk to you. So in summary, for the technical challenges, um, it remains difficult to consistently amplify low to moderate copy mRNA molecules in single cells. The C1 data are prone to type 2 error false negatives. <coughs> and they have a lot of zero inflated data. The future, uh, I would hope that we can improve our RT-PCR efficiency to low template levels, and we definitely need better data analysis methods. But having showed you all that, uh, we forged ahead anyway and uh, tried to look at the, the key biological problem we're interested in, and that's to analyzing individual allergen-specific CD4 T cells. So the example I'm going to show you is from peanut allergies. Um, our collaborators, this is by our collaborators, uh, Eric Quambury and Bill Kwok, um, have a, done a lot with peanut allergic T cells. And they're actually doing clinical trials to try to uh, desensitize people to peanut allergies and trying to figure out T cell or CD4 T cell assays to monitor the progress in trials and so forth. Uh, so peanut proteins have. Uh, about 11 allergic components. Uh, but peanut, there's only about five of them that cause major problems and that are major targets of IgE responses in people with uh, peanut allergies. And they're called ARH1, ARH2, 3, 4, or eight, 3, 6, and 8, sorry. And um, IgE levels against peanut allergens are highly correlated with clinical allergic status. So finding the cells that react with these peanut peptides is key to understanding peanut allergies. So um, over the years, uh, Bill and Eric have been looking at tetramer sorted peanut allergy cells. And recently, a, a refinement of that technique has come along, which offers us some advantages. That's uh, instead of using MHC tetramer, we're actually taking advantage of the fact that shortly after T cell receptor is engaged with antigen, um, a series of activation events take place, one of which is the expression of what's known as CD40 ligand on the surface of T cells. It's a very early activation event. And so using that CD40 ligand expression as a surrogate for activation, they can then sort uh, antigenic stimulated T cells without having to rely on a single MHC antigen complex. They can uh, get all the T cells that are stimulated by, um, or more than single T cells stimulated by antigenic peptides. So the flow workflow is like this. You take uh, vertical blood on nuclear cells. You block the uh, CD40 system on antigen presenting cells by adding mass because you don't want to have interference with the back signaling you add a mixture of uh, peanut and antigenic peptides. And you let the cell sit for a few hours. So you get a partial activation. So this helps us with our C1, and it also helps them uh, identify the antigenic and specific cells. They then uh, label the upregulated CD4 ligand with fluorescent antibody. They can then separate or enrich those activated cells and then sort for CD4 uh, cells that, that are then uh, uh, antigen specific. So using this method, uh, you don't get a lot of cells. Uh, this is their biggest, uh, most allergic patient, and they got about 4,000 human antigen specific <coughs> CD4 cells from that person. They only got about 500 from the healthy controller. And 
so we uh, put those into the C1, two different experiments, and made libraries. In this case, the uh, PCA sort of separates them, uh, although they're really overlapping populations. The, the normal cells tend to be down here, and the, the peptide ones, stimulated ones, are up there. When you actually use uh, feature extraction using a non-parametric method, um, you actually find very beautiful enrichment of uh, really nice uh, themes in the uh, genes uh, uh, more expressed in the allergic T cells. So the allergic T cells overexpress genes involved in lymphocyte activation, proliferation, and apoptosis. So they're more activated than the, than the healthy control cells. And that was known uh, that the, 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 the antigen-specific cells are primed in allergic individuals. I don't know if you can see it. I'll show you the next slide. This is a really beautiful uh, network here. There's IL-2, CTLA-4, CD40-LIDAM, which is good, good positive control, CTLA, TRAP-5, NSFA, cannabis cell right there. So really nice key um, T cell activation genes are higher in the uh, peanut allergy uh, individual than in the uh, healthy control. So this is pretty cool. Uh, so looking, this is showing the raw data that led to that network, showing you a handful of uh, T cell activation genes. The healthy control, uh, these genes are uh, negative or, or sort of mildly uh, positive uh, cells, and all except for the CD40 ligand. Now, CD40 ligand should be positive because that's what we use to isolate the cells, so that's good control. The peanut allergic uh, T cells, on the other hand, are Strongly positive for all of these. <coughs> and I should have told you previously, I think I forgot. We, uh, I, I isolated a total of 22 cells for the allergic individual and 10 uh, for the healthy control. So we're still dealing with small cell numbers here. So uh, T cell activation genes, again, are higher in the peanut allergic than they are in the healthy control. And this was sort of known. Um, the other thing that was uh, known was that the uh, peanut allergic cells tend to undergo apoptosis after stimulation. And so we're picking up apoptosis genes using an unbiased approach. Uh, the healthy control cells aren't a bust. They have some very interesting properties. Uh, several of them inter express interferon gamma. And this is what we're, uh, I'm just showing the sequence uh, reads now, aligning to the interferon these are piled up with the different exons of the interferon gamma. This guy has a good coverage of all the exons. This guy only has a three prime UTR. This guy only has a five prime exon. But still, there's still a pretty reasonable coverage here. And so nothing in the, uh, in the allergic T cells. So even though a lot of things are turned on in the allergic T cells, gamma interferon is not one of them. <coughs> Uh, interesting about this is that the other uh, previous work suggesting that the, uh, the difference between the allergic and the healthy control antigen specific cells is that the um, healthy control cells are more Th1 like and the uh, allergic cells are more Th2 like. And that, that there's speculation that that's the key difference between the two cell types or the cells in the two conditions. And consistent with that also is the expression of the a nice dichotomy there. So this reinforces what, uh, and supports what uh, people already knew or suspected. Uh, but this really doesn't justify going to all this trouble because um, they already knew it. So what, what do we find that's new here? Uh, well, one thing, uh, we're just starting this, so we have a long ways to go, but one thing that jumped out I think is very interesting 
is that there's another difference in the healthy controls in the uh, peanut allergy uh, cells, and that's the expression of this uh, gene NAV1. It's turned out at the top of the feature uh, uh, selection for this, uh, for being uh, different in the healthy controls. And this is shown here for comparison with two other genes, EGR1, EGR2, and now in the healthy controls, peanut allergy. You'll see the peanut allergy. Now what does this mean? Um, well, EGR early activation gene in NAV1, EGR1 is a very well known immediate early gene. You stimulate a cell with a mitogen and EGR1 is one of the first things come, that comes up, EGR1, EGR2. Um, it's known also to regulate IL-2 in conjunction with NFAT. It enhances T cell function. Uh, biochemically, NAV1 cells. Um, so it's logical then to hypothesize that since NAV1 is known to inhibit EGR1, that perhaps NAV1 might uh, inhibit EGR1 in the context of this uh, stimulation here. And if that's true, then you would expect uh, there to be a reciprocal relationship between IL-2 expression and NAV1 expression. As shown over here, cells express the uh, So it suggests a uh, hypothesis still that needs to be verified, but uh, it's consistent with the facts, working model, that TCR stimulation in allergic T cells leads to EGR1 regulation and then IL2 production T cell activation. In the healthy control cells, an additional early activation gene is turned on, which we know blocks EGR1 and can inhibit or, or modulate the uh, IL-2 activation. So this is one new type of hypothesis you can make from single cell transcriptomic data that would be very difficult to get using population uh, level data. So um, summarize uh, what I've told you then, uh, that uh, C1 enables RNA-seq transcript analysis from single individual antigen specific CD4 T cells. Um, the single cell analysis reinforces known differences and suggests new hypotheses, which we hoped it would. And while we still have a ton of challenges, especially in data analysis, um, the data support uh, uh, deeper analysis, and we're very excited about it. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank my collaborators, the uh, uh, lab team, uh, Lisa Israel from Cape, who spoke earlier this week at the conference. collaborators in this also, and they've been very generous with this sharing uh, information. So with that, I'll stop and take questions.
Yeah, well, I, I think I think it, you, you will um, just by using it, if you use 10, 100 cells in these conditions, you would still get noise, I think, um, because it's the, the the conditions, the volumes, and the concentrations that are so uh, complicated. Um, I think the um, if you did them in a tube, you probably would get information, but you won't get single cell information, and I think that's the, the real lure here we're trying to get. So. Yeah, so one thing I should say, the, 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 the capture is dependent on the pore size, and you have different capture rates depending on the size of the cells. Um, so it won't work to put PVMCs on here and look at all the blood because you're going to get different capture rates. And, uh, these particular uh, chips we're using, you'll probably capture most of the monocytes and you'll lose most of your T cells. Uh, but if you have individual populations, yeah, that will work. See you have all your uh, laser pointers. Sorry, <laughs> you mind? I just like to use laser pointer inside my fingers and uh, and the mouse coming. Up. Yeah, I think, okay, I, I think I'll talk while, while my computer is trying to, to, to do its work. So, uh, yeah, I want to thank Tom for, for inviting me here to, to uh, you know, let me talk, let me share about my work on, on engineering T-cell, especially, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm in the field of synthetic biology, so for those of you who's not familiar with this term, it's basically genetic engineering on steroids. So I take this quote from Jim Collins. And um, ba basically, we try to you know, do more sophisticated, more, more quantitative genetic engineering in living cells. And so, so I work in this field where you know, I, it's in the, in the boundary of immunology, cancer biology, and, and systems biology, uh, synthetic biology. So, um, so it's nice to have a, I talk to a different crowd, because when I talk to synthetic biology people, they don't understand immunology. When I talk to immunology people, they think I'm not trying to uh, re-engineer T cells, and uh, so I, I think this crowd, you guys will, will much appreciate what I try to do. So I try to do uh, synthetic uh, engineer T cells, especially for, for cancer therapy. So what, what people, if you think about the type of cancer therapy, of course, that's not limited to this, but these are some of the most popular ones that we are aware of. For example, the cytotoxic agent, basically poison, right? We just try to kill the cancer cell before we kill the patient. And then, uh, so we think that, you know, over time, we think that these, these, these poisons are tomb poisonous. We, you know, a lot of time they, they are tomb toxic. So, you know, over time, as people start developing these more specific drugs that target specific 
uh, uh, molecules such as kinase inhibitors, they're one of the uh, favorite targets. And then uh, also having some of these um, you know, <coughs> immunomodulating agents such as interleukin, cytokine, and things like that. So as you know, I like another kind of therapy. It's basically a cell-based immunotherapy, specifically using T cell, but I know some of you already know you can start using NK cell and also things like that. Uh, so why I like them? Because they can be very specific. They can also be extremely powerful to a point that's also toxic, and I'll talk about this as well. And finally, this is the last point that I think is make what makes it really powerful is that you can start programming logic, you can start programming feedback loops that's very difficult, if not impossible to do with small molecule, mainly because you just have a lot more things to work with, where a small molecule and biologics, they are very good. Don't get me wrong, I love them, they save lives. But you can, if you think about smart therapy, right, if you really think about, you know, there's a lot of talk about having smart therapy and things like that. Cells is the ultimate smart therapy. I don't think you can program anything much more complicated than a cell. So it will be a, my attempt to try to re-engineer that. So now let's talk about what was the state of the art of the field. And basically now what you can do is you can take patient's blood, which is very easy, you can purify T cells out of it, and then you can genetically modify them such that you can enhance their cancer killing capability, expand them ex vivo, and then inject them back to patients. And what's, what's most routinely done right now is to give them a tumor-specific receptor that allows them to home in to the cancer more specifically. And basically, there, there are two kinds of tumor-specific receptors. I'll talk, talk about it in a little bit more detail. Basically, these tumor-specific receptors is that when it binds to the antigen, it has these signaling domain that can uh, basically plug into the endogenous T cell receptor signaling pathway so that it turns on all the normal T cell response, and then such, and then it will initiate cell killing, cytokine production, proliferation, and so forth. So, what are some of these tumor-specific receptors that we're talking about? Now, the one that's getting a lot of attention lately is called a chimeric antigen receptor. Basically, it's a single-chain antibody fused to the intracellular signaling domain from the T cell receptor. For example, CD3, Zeta. Uh, uh, the, the signaling portion, the intracellular signaling portion. You can fuse it. Uh, and then, of course, out, now other people put in other uh, co signatory domain. They just fuse them together. And so, for example, CD20A, 4MBB, you can just take the intracellular signaling domain and lump them together. Surprisingly, it works for, for mechanisms that people still don't know about how it works. And then, obviously, you can also do is to isolate a tumor specific T cell receptor. That you can find them, people can find them by, by purifying the, the tumor infiltrating lymphocyte that's found on the tumor. Occasionally, they can sequence the, the T cell receptor and find them. Or, or you can try a direct uh, evolution in, in laboratory. So, um, it's especially with the chimeric antigen receptor, because it's mo very modular, you can just switch around the antibody. Um, so, there's a lot of these tumor specific receptors, at least 30 the last time I counted. Uh, these 10 of them are being tested in the clinics, and I'm going to talk about a little bit some of the uh, very exciting work in the field, which is actually have complete remission, so it energizes the field. Um, so these are, these are the work done, a lot of them are done by Carl June at UPenn, and also uh, uh, Mikhail Selling at uh, uh, Sloan Kettering, also at NIH as well. Sorry for those people at NIH that's here. I did not include some of their, their, their papers, so don't, don't get upset at me. Um, and don't tell your boss that I didn't include it. <laughs> so ba basically, uh, what, what, what this, especially with this uh, leukemia trial, this is a phenomenal success. So you can see here the complete remission. Uh, last time I counted seven patients. It, it's on New York Times and on CNN. So they tried it in children, tried it in adults. Basically, uh, they have a target against CD19. So CD19 is a marker found in pretty much, m mostly in B cell, but it's, it's found in healthy and normal uh, healthy and malignant B cells. So basically, these, these T cells will just basically go and destroy B cells. This engineered T cell will just destroy B cells. So it works great. It works really well. Uh, so the patients have durable, complete remissions, uh, a lot of them. But before then, there's also uh, 
before this phenomenon that says this was also uh, sort of darker history to this work is a patient die uh, using this type of technology, but in, it's not against CD19, but instead against HER2. So what happened is that they generate a receptor from Herceptin, just take out the light chain and the heavy chain and put in a single chain antibody. And when they do that, and they put, they overexpress them in the T cell and just shoot in the patient. And what happened is that the patient died. Uh, they develop, uh, you know, uh, immune, basically the, 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 these T cells start attacking the lung, the heart, which is expressing low level uh, HER2. So they go right and attack them right away. So the patient start developing a side effect within, I think, 30 minutes of the injection and then die in four days. So basically what we have right now it's a very powerful anti-cancer tool. Mm -hmm. What we don't have is control over them. Okay, so I think it, it's, it's a. It, I think it's a. It, there's a lot of analogy in the human, you know, throughout the course of uh, human technology development. For example, you know, flight, advanced flights, and missiles, and all these things. So we we have we know how to fly things, right? We know how to make explosive and so forth. But in order to make them useful. Now it's about control. Once we develop ways, you know, we develop missiles, develop uh, explosives, and so forth. How to control them will be the key to to all the, to you know to success to really implement them. So this is what we uh, this is basically uh, what, what I'm trying to do here. Uh, we ask, you know, can we engineer cells such that for can we target the cancer cell? Can we have them such that integrate multiple signals? For example, from cancer antigen and also from external signal. And then finally, can we engineer them such that they can automatically adjust to the proper <coughs> level? So basically what I'm trying to do here is you know, cre create a rudimentary version of cellular computations. Okay. So when, when I started this project, so a lot of this work was done when I was a postdoc at, at UCSF. Mm -hmm. um, even though there's a lot of e effort in, in, in genetics, in the uh, 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 cell already, but, but they're, they're, they're not, not the things that I really want to do. So I have to develop a lot of reagents uh, for, for controlling T cell activity. So one of the first things I did was basically, can I introduce, uh, engineer a system such that you know, when I act external molecules such as doxycycline, it will limit the the activity of the T cell, just do something, basically try to control the, the activity so that if it's too strong, I can limit them. If it's not strong enough, I can tune it up. So actually, I'm not going to go too much about it because this is it's still very preliminary work. Uh, we actually found a way uh, through GPCR, uh, artificial GPCR, uh, can find a way to, to tune up the signal length if the, if the activity is not strong enough. And then finally, can we combine some of the, for example, if I build some negative feedback loop and positive feedback loop, and combine them uh, to generate more complex circuits. In this case, I'll demonstrate an example where I can change the threshold of activation of T cell receptor signaling pathway. So now to achieve these things, one, one of the things uh, I think this is where this uh, field of synthetic biology is very good at and will really uh, uh, make a big contribution because like for, for the last 10 years, synthetic biology has been able to create very complicated genetic circuits, uh, at least in low organisms. For example, uh, uh, in one of my P uh, PhD labs and also several other labs around the world have been able to generate oscillator where concentration of protein can, can fluctuate over time. Uh, people can create very sophisticated logic gates. And then uh, uh, Jim Collins lab here can create counters. And also when I was in Wendell Lim's lab, we were able to create a lot of these uh, signaling control circuits. My question is, can we adopt these concepts and technology into T cell? So let's come to this. Before I move on, I, I need to you know, at least uh, refresh some of, uh, or, you know, some of you, of course, know more about these T cell receptor signaling than I do. For those of you who doesn't know as much, um, this will be a nice summary of the T cell receptor signaling pathway. Basically, uh, the, the, there's a T cell receptor binds to antigen. So, uh, and then the, the, these are T cell uh, CD3 zeta signaling uh, molecules. I didn't draw the other CD3 chain. And then it will be uh, phosphorylated by LCK and it's 
this the activity of LCK, this kinase inhibited by another kinase called CSK. So it will be important later on. That's why I color code them and, 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 and point it out to you. So when the T cell receptor is activated, it gets phosphorylated by LCK. And then we'll, we'll recruit SAP70. There's another kinase. When it's recruited, it also gets activated. And then it will phosphorylate more downstream signaling protein, especially these two molecules called LAT and SLIP76. They are, they're scaffold proteins. When they phosphorylate it, they will also recruit a bunch more other signaling proteins and then form, uh, some people start calling them the LAT signals. So when that form induces uh, further signaling cascade, and one of the more important ones is the MAPK signaling, the ERT MAPK signaling pathway. And then further down, they initiate it. Uh, one of the things that they initiate also is NFAT transcription factor, AP1 <coughs> transcription factor activations, and then these is at least for, for uh, one of the cytokines, it's in interleukin 2 production. So a lot of my experiment, what I did, is, first of all, I did a lot of my work in, in JERCAT um, because it's easier, because I, uh, it's, it's a great system for me to do a lot of uh, circuit design iteration. And as a readout, I have a nice reporter, which is basically an NFAT promoter driving GFP. And from now on, you know, uh, for space and also for, 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 uh, for simplicity, a lot of my signaling diagram will just be looking like that. So don't get upset if it's missing some of your favorite signaling molecule from T cell receptor. Um, I didn't mean to omit them. So now, in order to change the signaling of these T cell, I need a molecule that can actually do something to the signaling pathway. So one of the first things we try, actually, we find it very exciting. Uh, is that instead of using endogenous mammalian protein, we decided to use bacterial effector protein. It has, a very, it has several nice properties to it because some, they're very strong, they don't have mysterious regulations, and, and the one that we use, I, I find it very, very uh, cool, is that we use Yapage, which is like probably one of the most potent tyrosine phosphatase known, and it's from Yersinia's pestis, which is the black plague. Uh, this, this protein normally get you know, injected by, by the bacteria in, into, into immune cell, actually, to inhibit immune response. So they're very potent at shutting down immune response. And then another protein called OSPF, actually what's also very unique is that it has a, it has a very uh, uh, different chemistry than you would imagine uh, that will attack a MAPK. So, so OSPF, it's an uh, it's inhibitor for, for MAPK. What it does is that Normally, for example, if it's a phosphatase, it will just remove the phosphate group, leave the oxygen group around on the threonine. But this OSPF, not only does it remove the, the phosphate group, it also removes the oxygen on the phosphorylated threonine, <coughs> thus forming a double bond right here and prevents it from rephosphorylating again. Basically, it irreversibly modifies the MAPK. And, and what we found that these two proteins is extremely potent and inhibiting uh, T cell response. And one of the things that we, we show here is that, so if you overexpress uh, YAPH and OSPF and it activate the, the MAP case, I mean, activate the T cell receptor, mm. what we found is that, you know, you look at the NFAT transcription activity, you just kills it. You know, we also looked at fossil ERK, so fossil ERK is the activated version of ERK, also kills it. But one thing we also did is that we, we overexpressed SHIP1. But you can see here, it doesn't do anything. So <coughs> actually, that's why we, we like these uh, uh, bacterial effective molecule because a lot of time when you use endogenous protein, they're uh, they regulated on its own. So we know that SHIP1, for example, it's auto-regulated. It's normally auto-inhibited. So overexpressing these proteins uh, a lot of times don't do anything for you. And then even though it does something, for example, for a particular assay, you can imagine that it can be regulated in a way that you don't really know why, and it will stop working for you. Whereas we take these bacterial protein, it just become a very blunt tool, which is very useful for engineering. You don't want these mysterious regulations. So we really like it, and here's just this gel picture showing that these, all these proteins are, are, are expressed. Okay, so now we know that these protein works well for us, so we start doing some, some very simple engineering work. Basically, what we do is, okay, we want to build a negative feedback loop. What it does is that these negative feedback loop will allow us to tune the, 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 the maximum thrust uh, activation level. So the way we do that is uh, we have a promoter. Basically, we use NFAT promoter, AP1 promoter, 
that they will be activated uh, when the T cell receptor signaling pathway is turned on. So when they activate it, they will express these effective molecule, and then we'll also have a, a pest sequence that's fused to it so that it will limit the, uh, uh, the, the half-life of the protein. I mean, it will shorten the half-life. So what we see here is that this is dose response profile where we constitutively express the OSPF molecule or we have a simple negative feedback loop or it's OSPF with the pest sequence. So you can see here we can have a, you know, a gradient in response. So some, one thing about having negative feedback loop is actually a dynamic. Right? We've seen it earlier when, when Martin's talking about negative feedback loop is that it should go up and then comes back down. That's what, what those negative feedback loops should be doing. So what we've shown here is that here uh, is the time course uh, response of this uh, negative feedback loop. And here's the, you know, with the negative feedback loop with, with, with OSPF, OSPF pest, constitutive, or no OSPF. You can see here, uh, this is fossil ERK response so that we can see a single cell level. So what's very really nice about it is that it, it jumps up really quickly and then with wild type uh, cell it stays on for a long time. Whereas uh, with, with constitutive uh, expression of OSPF, it stays low so it doesn't get activated. But with the negative feedback loop is that, you know, it turns it on because ERK, you know, doesn't get expressed in, in as quickly as ERK gets turned on. So, so ERK gets turned on and then OSPF start expressing after an hour or so and then start driving down the fossil ERK activity. So, so the negative feedback loop works well for us. And finally, so as I said before, it has a lot of these things in, in, in jerk cat and of course, some of you don't think jerk, or not, maybe not people here, but a lot of people in the field don't think jerk as a real T cell. Um, I happen to like them a lot because they're very easy to work with. So we have to put them in primary T cell to really show that it actually do something. And one of the things that we did, instead of also uh, putting them into a negative feedback loop, we also generate what we call POS, which basically it's a very simple system where uh, a, we have a do doxycycline inducible promoter driving the OSPF gene. Basically, uh, we have this in mind as a, as a, you know, for adaptive immunotherapy, if, if something goes wrong, uh, if it's too strong, we can add a drug and then we just tune it down, the, 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 the T cell response. So, so what we did here, we used CD4 T cell, primary T cell, and we, we, we put in, you know, through lentibiotransduction, transduction, uh, uh, a doxycycline inducible promoter driving OSPF, and then we measure you know, cytokine production, cytokine production, proliferation, and so forth. So here is one of the first experiments we show that we can actually do a dose response profile by if we change different uh, concentration of doxycycline, we can, we can tune how much interleukin-2 uh, it can produce. What's nice about it is that it's using this type of approach it's reversible. If we remove the doxycycline, wait until the protein degrades, then the T cell can be reactivated again. So I think that's, that's crucial because a lot of time when we think about using these things in adoptive immunotherapy, because these, first of all, these therapies are expensive and they are painful to administer uh, to the patients. Uh, I, I can talk about it a little bit more, but you don't want to do it many times. You don't want, uh, you know, you, you just only want to administer the, the, the cell once. So maybe you can tune it down a little bit, maybe the, the patient's response better, maybe you can leave it, turn it back up again. So basically having a tighter control over these expensive and painful therapy, I think will be very powerful. So what we did here is that we uh, have these cells that, that's modified with the doxycycline inducible OSPF, and then we add doxycycline at time zero and then we, we let it do for six hours so that it will induce the expression of OSPF, and then we wash away the doxycycline. And then here, basically the bottom positive uh, means that, you know, when do we add the stimulation? Either at six hours, the stimu when we stimulate the T cell receptor. Either at six, uh, zero hours, six hours, or 18 hours. So the plot on the top here is interleukin-2 production, and the plot on the bottom measures cell division. So if we activate the T cell at, at time zero, you can see that there's not much different right here uh, if, because the OSPF actually not produced. So you still get a nice interleukin-2 pro production and, and you can still initiate cell division. But if you start inducing 
uh, at six hours, then you see a marked uh, big difference because you have a lot of uh, OSPF produced and, and also uh, therefore you cannot trigger the, the T cell response. But if you wait for another 12 hours, wait for the protein to degrade to turnover, then you can activate the T cell again. So this shows reversibility, which is very, that's a very nice property that we can turn them off, turn them on if we want to. So this is, is more like a time course response. So we start off with, uh, you know, we start off with, you know, a, we activate a T cell, give them a pulse, wash away, and then the, the response comes back up, whereas we continually uh, add doxycycline, then it will you know, sustain. So now we, we demonstrate you know, some of these simple tools that allow us to basically turn the T cell on and off uh, with the addition of drugs. So next thing I want to do, okay, and now I know how to find ways to turn off T cells, I want to find ways to, that allow me to crank up the activations of T cells. So um, one of the things that I did was positive feedback loop, and I'll talk with you a little bit on how I use them afterward as well. So um, the basic circuit design of generating a positive feedback loop, it, it's very similar to a negative feedback loop, where uh, T cell receptor signaling that activates uh, you know, uh, uh, NFAT or promoter, AP1 promoter, NFAT promoter, and then driving a positive effector that will sustain the signal and keeps on going like that. So um, one of the things that, that you can imagine now, okay, this is a very simple concept, but where you're going to get your positive effector that will allow you to turn on the, the T cell receptor signaling. Um, that took me two years to find. So finding the bacteria effector and show that it inhibits uh, T cell response, that was easy. That took like two months, actually. And then finding this one guy here took me two years. Oh, fine. Oh, before I move on, so, so here I also want uh, uh, this quite a bit of readout that I did. Uh, I'll show you some, some uh, measurement on the ERK signaling, on NFAT, and also on uh, interleukin-2 production. So I need a positive effector. So I'm not going to tell you all the failures that went through. Uh, we will we'll not go home today. But uh, eventually, uh, I figured that if you, so these LAT and SLIP76 molecules, these signaling, these molecules in the signal zone, that they normally don't come together until the pathway is activated. So if you fuse them together, I, I think that a lot of times it will actually activate the pathway. It's just basically force them together by fusion. And that's what we did, and here's what we found is that if I fuse LAT and SLIP76 together, for, so it's generating a synthetic LAT signal, so it constitutively activates the pathway, and then you can actually further increase it by activating it. So this is great, but having a constitutively activated T cell is not useful. So right, that, that actually can be very dangerous. So this is where a positive feedback loop can be, can be useful. So what we did is that we put a last SIP76 under the you know, NFAT promoter so that this molecule won't be expressed until the pathway is turned on. So what happened is that all of a sudden we, we have lower basal and then now uh, we have increased activity. And then just to show that this uh, uh, negative feedback loop uh, is actually a lot, or well this is a different types of ERK stimulation it's actually much more transient than the one I showed you before. Uh, you can activate ERK and then through a different types of ERK stimulations, uh, you can actually lower it, uh, it, it go back down, but with the positive feedback loop, after about two hours, it actually jumps back up. You can see that this ERK, fossil ERK profile, that, you know, at time five, zero minutes, the both constructs look the same. At five minutes, they both look very similar. But at two hours, what you saw is that a lot of the, uh, um, uh, with the positive feedback loop, it stays high. A lot of cells stay at a sort of uh, at a high ERK uh, on state, where the wild type stuff falls back down. So this is just another way of sh more the dynamic uh, of showing this how how this ERK. Uh, this positive feedback loop works. So it actually, you know, activates not just the NFAT pathway, but also the, the ERK pathway. Finally, this is the interleukin-2 production. It also mirrors the NFAT production. 
So now, okay, um, let's go back to the early, earlier problem about you know, the, the, this issue of, of thresholding. Ba basically, uh, what we saw uh, in, in one of the paper where, where there's a fa fatal uh, side effect is that these engineered T cells cannot differentiate. They can actually find targets really well. They just can't tell the difference between high and low. And with this kind of powerful therapy, that, that's a problem. That's a big problem. Right? So what, what basically, in terms of you think about those response profile, what actually happened is that uh, if this is the, the ligand concentration and this is T cell response, let's say up to a certain level, it's enough to, to kill cells. Basically, your dose response profile is tune sensitive, right? This is, let's say this is the concentration of ligand that's on normal cell, the off target, and this is the concentration of ligand on tumor. Basically, it's tune sensitive. That's what you have. And what you really want to do is be, be able to shift the threshold such that it, be, it have some, this type of characteristic. So my, my question is twofold, right? One thing is that first, uh, you know, what, what can I do to, to get that more, more desirable uh, dose response profile? And then a second, it's much more, a, a more basic question about signaling. What regulates threshold, right? Especially about, in terms of signaling, how can the signaling structure affect thresholds, right? So, so there's a more, more fundamental question. And I also, what's very nice about synthetic biology or just re-engineering things is that you can start probing <coughs> you know, what kind of network structure will give you what kind of signaling profile. So what we've, so let's go back to one of the uh, molecules that I briefly talked about but didn't go into too much. It's about this CSK molecule. So basically this CSK molecule is a kinase that sort of keep the T cell receptor in an inactive state by inhibiting the, the, the LCK activity. So in a, in a mechanism that people are starting trying to work out is that when, when T-cell receptor is activated, somehow it causes the CSK to at least temporarily false off the membrane and allows the T-cell LCK to, to phosphorylate, the T-cell receptor initiate T-cell uh, receptor signaling. And what we found is that uh, if you overexpress this molecule CSK, what it can do is actually it can shift the threshold it can actually increase the threshold by a couple fold. And, but at the same time, it lowers the, the, the maximum activation. So people know that if you overexpress CSK, it can sort of inhibit uh, T, T cell activation. But, but this is the actual <coughs> response. It lowers the, the maximum activation and then also increases the threshold. So this is actually pretty good, especially if we want to, let's say, control threshold. But, but now, you know, let's say, if, for example, we want to increase the threshold but doesn't want to lose the maximum activation, so what can we do? One thing we can do right now is that combined with the positive feedback loop that I've generated it, such that you can overexpress CSK and at the same time introduce this positive feedback loop, such that when the T cell receptor is activated, you know, CSK falls off and then but allows you to express this positive feedback loop. And what we, what we show is that if you incorporate these two components together, that uh, we can actually increase the threshold but without sacrificing the dynamic range. And, and this is uh, uh, some older result. Actually, we were able to find actually other kinds of signaling molecule, for example, sap 70 sh 2 domain, and all these things that allow us to actually increase, depending on how much we express as well, to systematically increase the, the threshold up to 20 fold. So actually what we think uh, it's very interesting from, from this type of work is that, you know, so obviously a big, a lot of the time, the, act, the, the threshold of activations is controlled by uh, the affinity of the receptor, okay? O also even the, the expression level of the receptor. And we think that, you know, the, the especially the affinity will basically the, the govern the, the big, you know, if the, the major area of, of, of the threshold of activation. But if the cell needs to fine tune the, the activation threshold. They can do that by changing the signaling molecule concentration. For example, they just need to tune it twofold, threefold, right? They can, they can do that, and they're gonna probably compensate with another positive feedback loop, you overexpress them. Whereas, you know, if I wanna change the mute, you know, otherwise I have to mutate the, 
the, the receptor binding affinity, right? I think that's much harder to do. Whereas if, whereas you start <coughs> changing the, the concentration of signaling mo molecule inside a cell, it allows you fine tuning. And then we've shown that the range can be, you know, 10, 20 fold, right? Which is a lot of time, you know, a good working range. So yeah, so, so that summarizes a, a lot of my, my uh, postdoctoral work. And, and right now, what I want to do is basically continue on at, at BU, focusing on this problem. Like, how am I going to improve this car-based uh, adaptive immunotherapy? So as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, car is composed of you know, the, the single-chain antibody and, and the intracellular signaling domain. And what a lot of time is that, you know, you saw the example earlier where, where uh, the, the, the car was too sensitive and it, it can start uh, attacking normal cells uh, that expresses the low level of antigen. So the question really is that what, what is the optimal affinity of the, uh, of the chimera antigen receptor? What is the expression level? And what is the genetic composition that will give you, let's say, the, the most desired response, right? And also, a lot of the time, when we think about you know, T cell activation, there's also multiple types of response. T cell can have cytotoxicity, have cytokine production, even cytokine production, there's different kinds, right? There's interleukin-2, interferon gamma, and all, so forth, and then proliferation. And people actually, it's, it's known for a long time that the cytotoxicity threshold, it's much lower than the cytokine production. And also that the, the activation of co-stimulatory pathway, that you activate CD20A, you activate 4-MBP, changes the threshold of activations. So one thing that I, one thing I want to do right now uh, here is to systematically quantify how, how these changes, the genetic changes, you know, when you change the affinity, when you change the expression level by changing different promoters and also the genetic makeups of the signaling domain, how that affect each individual threshold and uh, the dose response profiles. So uh, for, for each type, for so the cytotoxicity, the cell killing, and even for cytokine, diff interleukin-2, interfering gamma, how's the threshold of activation, how's the hill coefficient, how's that affecting? So what I will do right uh, here is, we already started a little bit, is to, to characterize the dose response profile for every genetic uh, component. Uh, we, we're gonna characterize <coughs> the basal, the hill coefficient, the maximum activation level, and, and the threshold. And then we, we, you know, we talk about a lot of modeling, uh, so far, but for, for here, right now, I'm basically trying to sort of generate a, just a working equation that allow me to have these some kind of predictions over what, what to expect. So I'm gonna build a phenomenological model. It doesn't include any of the intracellular signaling uh, components uh, because I, I don't think I can get enough of those, uh, but maybe somebody will, will change my mind. But basically what I'm going to do is measure a lot of these, generate a lot of these dose response profiles for different genetic construct. Uh, but what I do expect is that, for example, that the maximum activation will be, um, will be just a, a function of the genetics. It won't be a function of the, uh, of the, of the affinity. And actually, this, is, uh, uh, this has been shown experimentally, so it's not like what I've just made up. So uh, apparently the cars uh, will be, you know, the maximum activation level, the maximum cytokine production, it's independent affinity. It, the affinity changes the threshold, but it doesn't change the maximum activations. But the basal will be dependent on the, the car concentration, so how much you express, um, and then also dependent on the genetic makeups, and then also the, the threshold will be dependent, we believe would be actually depend on the concentration, the affinity, and the genetics, and then finally, the hill coefficient. And actually, I don't really quite know what to expect. So what I want to do at the end is, is actually uh, create a bunch of these dose response profile and then correlate these parameter as a function of uh, different genetic makeups and, and affinity. And actually, I hypothesize, I don't have any, I don't have any data to support it. I, I think that these parameters will be independent of antigen identity is that even though you have something against CD19 or something against uh, uh, HER2, only the affinity matters, not the actual genetic makeups. But I do believe that 
these, these parameters will change depending on different cancer cell line. So some cell line might be easier to kill than the other one. So, but uh, again, uh, this I'll have to do experiment to, to find out. And then finally, uh, uh, some of you might be aware that actually people starting to this chimeric antigen receptor work, instead of having one chimeric antigen receptor, they have two chimeric antigen receptors. So one chimeric antigen receptor uh, have a, you know, they actually, what, what they did is that uh, normally the, the one that's been, everybody's been using, there's, let's say there's two or three intracellular signaling domain within a chimeric antigen receptor. What they did is they split it into two chimeric antigen receptors. One chimeric antigen receptor has a CD3 zeta domain, and one chimeric antigen receptor has the other two signaling domains, CD4 and BB and so forth. And what they found was that it's quite interesting from this work is that you cannot have both receptor have a high affinity uh, antibody. It, it, it will just, it wouldn't, rec it wouldn't have this combinatorial effect. It will still recognize individual one. So what they have to do is that one of the, one of the uh, receptors has to have a lower affinity, less efficient. So they call it inefficient. That way they can, then they can only kill the cell that has two receptors instead of just one. Whereas you have both of them that has high affinity or efficient receptor, they will kill both cells that has high, uh, that has one or two receptors. So, so again, then, then my, my model that uh, will also, not my characterization will also extend into this space in a combinatorial fashion as well. If I have one receptor, and then let's say I fix one of the receptor, and how does having the other receptor, the expression level, the affinity, affects the sort of the selectivity. And then finally, one thing that I also want to do is that, okay, we have this, let's say, you know, we have this blueprint of, of, of the receptor, but uh, uh, what kind of ex receptor expression do I want? But a lot of the time is that, you know, in vivo, I still maybe, I want to adjust. Okay, once I put these T cells in the patients, what if it's not right? What if my prediction is wrong? Right, it's not at the right threshold. It's not at the right expression level. Is there anything I can do to change it? Right? That's the thing about cells is that you, you can program it. You can do something about it. So one of the things that I was already working actually, develop a lot of these genetic circuits such that if we add a drug, it will change the, the threshold. I add a drug, I will change the, the, the expression level. So it actually what we do is it will be a, a, a transient pulse. So we'll add a drug for let's say a week or so, and then it will change the expression level uh, forever. So this is a dynamic toggle switch. Uh, if you, if, uh, not dynamic toggle switch, but, but it, it's a toggle switch that allows us to tune either the expression level or, or, the, or the threshold. Finally, one, one of the things that uh, probably more deal with, with the safety issue is, is basically can we just, if we don't need the therapy anymore, okay, let's say the patient's in remission, can we just turn it off, right? But what I do want is that, okay, you can, people have already done this, is that, well, why don't we just kill the cells, okay? When the, when the therapy's over, we can just kill the cells. Um, but, but a lot of time, we all know cancer therapy, they have relapse and so forth. Um, and, and, but then you have to do it again, okay? So we ask a very simple question. Can we turn off the T cell? Let's say we, we turn off the expression of the receptor. And then if the patient relapsed, hopefully, well not hopefully, but if it's the same antigen again, it's not an escape, then we can turn it back on. So instead of doing the therapy again, where it's expensive, it's also painful to do, can we just turn it on? So there, there are these uh, recombinases out there Allow, it's sort of like pre and locks that, that allows you to uh, do a stable conversions. Where, where you know, pre locks where a lot of time it, it, it's, well, uh, it's, un it's irreversible. Right? You do it once and that's about it. But there are enzymes that allow you to be reversible that works like pre locks. So we, we're working on it as well uh, right here. And this tool, uh, although I use it in cancer setting, you can imagine it's very powerful in just doing a lot of mammalian genetics. So uh, with that being said, um, uh, that's all I have to say for my work. So a lot of my work, so, so I'm, I'm kind of jealous. Uh, I've seen a lot of talks that have like 50 collaborators <laughs> with enormous amount of funding, um, which I don't have. Uh, I have like 
mainly my advisors, uh, Wendell Lim, Artwise. Some of you might know Artwise. He's a, uh, a, a, a immunologist at, at UCSF. And these are, you know, postdocs and, and grad students that work with me. Um, also. And these are the funding that my, my boss has, not me, uh, Wendell. Uh, I got the ACS postdoctoral fellowship. So uh, that's all I have to say. So uh, more than happy to take questions. Yeah, um, I, I don't have a solution to it, to be honest. I've thought about it. There's many problems in, in the therapies, in the adoptive immunotherapies. Uh, one of them being specificity, one of them being safety, and other one being efficacy. And efficacy, it's uh, directly related to how long the T cell can live in the patient's body, and also other problem as well. So, I mean, I think there's a work by, actually by Christina Smolke, uh, and, and uh, at Stanford where they have a, a drug, a theophylline inducible system where it produces interleukin-2. So they can just put that along with the chimera antigen receptor, for example, and then they can add theophylline and just produce interleukin-2. That, at least in mouse model, has shown that it can allow the T cell to survive longer. Um, you can imagine, you can put into, I think interleukin-15 they try as well, and different other kind. Um, I'm not too sure whether it will really work in, in, in human, um, to be honest, I don't have much better idea how to improve persistent expression in a dynamically uh, fashion. So, but yeah, at least that, that's one, one solution that I can think of. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me get this, uh, let me see if I understand your question. So, so the, the T cell that we engineer, are they more effective of memory T cell? So, so yeah, that's actually a major uh, effort in the field. So like it's also related to persistent issue. What people found is that if, if the engineered T cell, the, like before you shoot them back in the patients, if they are more memory characteristic, especially on the central memory type of T cell, they are, they are much more powerful. So there's a lot of technology, a lot of effort, so more like empirical efforts, like how we grow the cell, when we, when we grow the cell, like how the preparation of the cell, you know, how do we activate them, how do we do the lentiviral transduction, how do we uh, you know, prepare them so that they are more towards, bias them towards the development of central uh, memory T cell. And there's work on, there's this new population, I think it's, it's actually found by NIH, right? On, on these uh, memory stem cells. They found that if, if you can, if somehow you get enough of these memory stem cells, and they also have cars, they, they, they put them in mice, then it's much more effective. They live longer. Um, the challenge right now is, you know, how are you gonna generate a lot of these memory stem cells, right? the, the, the better kind. I think uh, there's also related to, I think naive T cells also very good as well. Um, we just, we just don't know how to get enough of them and also modify them. So it's right now it's very empirical and I'm not smart enough to, to figure that out. Um, but yeah. Yes. Could you go back to your slide 32 the technological point? Yeah. Race to the end power. Race, race to the to the hill coefficient. So this is a this is a typical typical uh, hill type equation when you describe sigmoidal types of re reaction. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a plus sign. That's a plus sign. That's a plus sign. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for that. That's that's a good catch. I'm curious. You showed this. Early 
earlier work. Yeah, yeah. The, the earlier work, a lot, uh, I thought about it, but it, it's a simple negative feedback loop. I, so it just didn't seem Yeah, it doesn't add much to it. Um, but definitely on, you know, if I start building mm -hmm. more complicated networks, actually I'm making the bulky. Uh, so there's a lot of genetic circuit that's more complicated, especially the dynamic switching. Then yeah. actually I'm building models on it to see how, how long does it take, right? And, you know, during the transition time, uh, you know, when it's switching between one threshold to another threshold, what's the effect on the cells? And this will be very interesting to, to model. And then one thing I was talking to, to Joseph about, it's actually uh, in vivo model, mm -hmm. right? I worry a lot. I'm sure some of you might be questioning quietly that all these in vitro model doesn't mean anything in vivo. I worry that a lot. If you guys have an idea, tell me uh, <laughs> what to do. In the meantime, I, I'll stick with in vitro. Hopefully give me some kind of guidelines. Hopefully the trends are similar in vivo. But yeah, I worry about that a lot if you questioning that. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>